All right, in this video, we'll begin Unit 1, The Chemistry of Life for AP Bio, looking first at the structure of water and hydrogen bonding. Before we do that, we're going to look at this concept of emergent properties because this is something that we will be dealing with the entirety of this class, essentially, starting in this unit, uh, dealing with molecules, but ending up talking more about bigger ideas like ecosystems in the biosphere. But the idea of emergent properties is basically this, is that as you have individual pieces, those individual pieces have their own properties, but as those pieces are combined together, new properties emerge from the combination of those things. And so consider like a puzzle that you put together. Each individual piece has a picture on it, and that picture may represent nonsense because it just isn't complete, but it does represent something. And as you put the puzzle together, the the entirety of the picture starts to emerge and you start to see this whole new thing. And so as we are dealing with molecules in this unit, what we're going to see is that as you combine molecules in different ways, the properties of those molecules change completely. And we're looking at with water today, water is made up of individual subcomponents as well. But as you add those subcomponents, the property for the whole changes. And so let's look at the structure of water. Well, water is composed of a single oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms. That oxygen atom is made up of eight protons and eight electrons. And each hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. And when they bind together, they will share all 10 of those electrons. You have one oxygen, two hydrogens, and they will share all 10 of those electrons. And when you have atoms that bind together and share their electrons, this is called a covalent bond. Co, sharing, valent, is, stands for the valence electrons, and so it's sharing those valence electrons. So they're covalent. They're sharing electrons. Very strong bond. And oxygen, or water doesn't share those electrons equally. Electrons really like protons. Electrons are negatively charged. Protons are positively charged. And positives and negatives tend to attract one another. And so what you have then is you have these 10 electrons that want to spend the majority of their time near the oxygen because there's more positives there. And so what this causes to happen is the oxygen end of this atom or this molecule tends to be more negatively charged. And since the electrons are all up there, these two hydrogens are just kind of by themselves, and so they're more positively charged. And this causes water to behave in different ways. What we call, we call this uh, phenomena polarity. The polarity is easily defined as the unequal sharing of electrons. Typically has to do with po covalently bonded molecules. Not all covalently bonded molecules are polar. Here's a couple of examples of nonpolar molecules wherein those electrons are equally shared throughout the molecule. But water is an example of a polar molecule in that the oxygen is hoarding those electrons more frequently than the hydrogens are. Water is not the only polar molecule that we will deal with, but it is definitely kind of the stand in example for polarity because it's easy to see on this particular molecule. We'll be dealing with lots of molecules that have polarity and it's essentially the same sort of properties that emerge from that. Because of water's polarity, it is able to form bonds with itself. And so the if you have another water molecule, imagine this negative here is going to be attracted to the positive of the other water molecule. These bonds are called hydrogen bonds. So a hydrogen bond is when one polar molecule is attracted to another polar molecule. It's not a very strong bond. It's like a, almost like a, a magnetism that exists here. Here you see this negative oxygen combining with this water molecule's positive hydrogens. And it causes, there is energy here that is between these two. There is a bond here, just like if I have an eraser that has a magnet in it and I put it to my whiteboard, it will stay up there. It doesn't take a whole lot of energy to remove that bond, but it will stay up there. And so there is some attraction to it. Now, this causes water to behave differently because water is very attracted to itself. 
it, it loves itself. And we call this idea, well, and here's another example of this real quick. So here's one water molecule actually forming hydrogen bonds with four other water molecules. And so this causes water, again, to be highly attracted to itself. And we call this idea cohesion. And cohesion can happen between other molecules, but it's typically talked about when we talk about water. And this is basically when two molecule, two of the same kinds of molecules form hydrogen bonds with one another, and they're highly attracted to each other. This is an example where you often see the cohesion of water. Water is more attracted to itself than it is to this leaf. This leaf, this leaf actually produces hydrophobic, which means water fearing produces hydrophobic compounds that cause water to just kind of slide off of it. If you think about leaves and trees, when it rains, all that weight could get really heavy and could actually damage the tree. And so these leaves produce a compound that causes water to slide off of them and go to the ground. And that's why you see it beating up like this, because it's more attracted to itself than it is to the leaf. Opposite of that is called adhesion, and this is when two different molecules form hydrogen bonds with one another. Um, this is something that we're all experiencing in this day and age, having to wear masks. And if you have glasses, uh, those and that glass that the glasses are made of really likes the water in your breath. It's because glass or silicon dioxide is a highly polar molecule. Polar molecules really like one another and they can form hydrogen bonds with one another. And so when the water in your breath comes in contact with the hydro or with the polar molecules in glass, they form hydrogen bonds and the water sticks to glass. There are ways to prevent this. You have to come up with some sort of strategy like the leaf did. Usually people will find some sort of non-polar molecule to rub on their glasses to prevent that from happening. Well, in living systems, these properties of water can create some different sorts of things that really have caused living systems to thrive. One of these is called surface tension. And surface tension basically is this. This is the increased interaction between water molecules that are on the surface of the water. So if you go back to this picture, if down in the water, water is just kind of stable because it's bound with all these other water molecules that are around it, whereas near the surface, there's no water on top. And so it strengthens the bonds with the water that are right next to each other on the surface. And it causes this kind of surface tension, this water dropping here, not the water drop not exploding is a great example of water uh, of surface tension because it's keeping this water droplet intact. Some animals can use this to their advantage by allowing them to just kind of sit on top of the water. This uh, particular organism here called a water strider has hydrophobic pieces on its legs that allow it to just kind of sit on top of the water, move around and do life the way that it does life. Another property of water that has emerged for living things is something called solvency. Solvency is just the idea that water, that things can dissolve in water. Sometimes you'll hear water referred to as the universal solvent. It's not necessarily 100% true because not all things can dissolve in water. Only polar things are things that have a charge. And so here's an example of salt, which is made up of negative and positive ions, and water is able to take it away because you have the chlorine that is negative, and the positives of the water attract to it, and the sodium that is positive, and the negatives of the water attract to it, and it just kind of pulls it apart piece by piece, causing that to dissolve. Now, what would happen if the uh, water, like evaporated out of the, let's say you have a jar of salt water, the water evaporated out, well then those salt pieces would just kind of all get attracted to each other and be left there in the bottom of the jar. And so this, the idea that water is a solvent, that it can dissolve things is, I mean, it's the way our whole bodies work, essentially. Uh, the things that we eat, the things that we take into our bodies, 
can be used, can be dissolved in water and the bodies can use them because our cells are primarily made up of water. And so you can see how this, this could work for living systems. We are not dry. We are composed primarily of water. The next idea here is water's density as a solid. It is actually less dense as a solid than it is as a liquid. And so this causes water to float or causes ice to float on water. This is much different than the other solids and liquids. And the reason this is, is because as ice decreases in temperature, as it nears the freezing point, the molecules are moving around less, which makes sense, right? Because we understand that more temperature means more energy, means more movement. So the opposite is true then too. Less temperature, less energy, less movement, and those molecules begin to stabilize and form these more exact structures. They're not moving, and so they kind of get stable. Whereas in this liquid water, they're all kind of moving around, forming bonds with each other, breaking bonds. In this picture, they're more stable. And this actually increases the angle between those molecules. And as I, you can see here, they're all squished together. And then they're more stable state that increases those bond angles. And it causes water to kind of spread out, thus making it more or less dense because density is has to do with the amount of volume and so water takes up more volume but still retains the same mass and so then becomes less dense and so then ice floats well this is good if you are an organism that lives in cold water like these penguins for instance they can jump up on the ice they can go underneath the ice to do their fishing it also is a good if you're a fish because as water freezes what does it do it floats to the top and it keeps actual water underneath the ice for so that you can continue to live and so this is this is why arctic ecosystems are arctic ecosystems were it not for this there would be frozen solid oceans and so it, it keeps animals and plant life alive the next is the high cap heat capacity of water water's ability to absorb high amounts of energy before evaporating and so this has to do with again the number of hydrogen bonds that can form in water molecules it's up to four per molecule and it takes energy to break all of those bonds and so in order for water to evaporate it has to break all of these bonds well imagine all of these bonds times all the water molecules that are in the pot or whatever it takes a lot of energy well because of this water is able to hold lots and lots of energy it's able to heat up really hot before it actually begins to evaporate this is good for a lot of reasons our earth for instance absorbs the sun's energy all day where the oceans are and then when it gets dark at night those oceans then release that heat back into the atmosphere and keep the earth from freezing which is a very good thing our bodies use this in an opposite way when our bodies want to cool down the first things that they do is get rid of the water that is in them the water contains a lot of energy and so then we sweat in order to get rid of that energy so it's a, it's a way for living systems to regulate their heat and lastly is the concept of capillary action. Capillary action is water's ability to climb up small tubes. If you've ever been to the doctor and they took a blood sample, for instance, you've probably, they took a little glass tube and they poked it on the wound that they just created on your finger and the blood just kind of goes up into the tube. Well, it's because water likes glass as we demonstrated earlier and so it, it's attracted to the glass and as water climbs the tube because it's attracted to the glass it is pulling the other water molecules up the tube because water really likes itself and so it creates this capillary action whereas water is just climbing up the tube this is used in living systems particularly in plants this tree takes in water from the roots as you can see down here and that water will actually climb up these tubes that are called xylem and it will climb up those tubes all the way to the leaves and it's being pulled out of the leaves by evaporation through a process called transpiration 
And so as it's being pulled out of the leaves, it's being pulled up, up the tree, up to, you know, several hundred feet because some trees can be hundreds of feet. And this is the only way that is able to happen is through this capillary action that is found inside the plant cells.